Hey, great to see everybody here this morning. My name is Bill. If I have not gotten a chance to to meet you, the pastor here, and very excited that you are all here with us this morning. If you're visiting, especially glad that you're here. We love the opportunity to meet you and to get to know you. Pray and hope that you feel welcomed uh, and encouraged this morning. Jessica was up here a minute ago, just right outside that door. She mentioned she'll be at a connections table. We'd love to, uh, uh, she'd love to meet you. We'd love to get connected uh, with you, and I'd love to meet you at the door as well. So be sure to go by and see her. She has a gift for you as well. And those of you watching online, whenever or wherever you are, hope and pray that you feel welcomed uh, this morning. Feel comfortable if you're sitting on your couch for sure. So um, uh, anyways, um, hey, uh, we are, um, uh, this is, a, this is, a, is, a, is a, going to be a big day here. So um, we're going to be talking about some stuff with the building here at, at the end of the service. And uh, we have a meeting right after church, maybe about 10, you know, give about 10 minutes and then we'll meet right here in the sanctuary and talk about some, some things that are going on here at our church. But I wanted to, to, to give a message uh, this morning um, that I think will be encouraging for us, um, just related, not even just related to our church, but also related to your own personal life um, as well. And so uh, anybody ever heard of uh, Zarina Williams and uh, Venus Williams? Yeah, so uh, they're like tennis players, I think. Um, and uh, they, they've, you know, a little bit of fame. They've won a couple things uh, here and there. So, uh, but they're like incredible, awesome tennis players, right? So both of, both of them have won like uh, major championships multiple times, Wimbledon mul- multiple times, just incredible athletes. Well, if you, if you didn't know the story, which I didn't know much of the story at all until this movie came out called King Richard, and it's about uh, their father, Richard Williams, and really the vision that he had in mind for these girls. Matter of fact, um, and this is a true story. Um, I, I, I believe it was before he was, they were born, he had in his mind that he wanted to uh, have tennis champions. He and his wife already had some kids, but he wanted to um, raise girls um, uh, that were going to be Wimbledon champions, tennis champions. So when they had these girls, I think at two years old, they start playing tennis, and he had a map. He literally had like a road map, a plan laid out for these kids. And so they're starting to play tennis at a young age, and I think they were... um, out in L.A. area, not, not really a good area for a while, but these, these girls are growing. They're getting really good. And then he connected with somebody in Florida. They moved, like, he left his job. He, they moved to Florida, um, and they're living out there. They're doing homeschool, and they're at this tennis camp. They're playing tennis, like, all day long and doing homeschool. I mean, it's incredible commitment uh, that he had. But, you know, and obviously it paid off, <laughs> you know? I mean, you have no idea, like, how it was going to work. You know, maybe the kids, like, you know, throw down the racket, like, I'm done with this. I don't want to do this anymore. Or, um, you know, they get injured or whatever. But, like, he had a vision in mind for these girls, and they, re- they responded to it. And, you know, they, I've seen them interviewed, and they apparently had, have a good relationship with their father. And you would think how much he could have been driving them. But apparently they had a really good relationship, and, you know, they would take days off a lot if they needed it or whatever like that. But, um, but it's amazing to me, like, this guy, this dad had this incredible vision for his kids, and, and he just worked it out, you know? And, I'm, and of course, I, I think about that, I'm like, man, I am worthless, man. <laughs> like, I mean, I, I don't have a vision for my kids to be like Wimbledon champions, you know? Um, but, uh, but, you know, and I don't know if your parents maybe were like that in your life, that you felt like you grew up and like they had that, something in mind and, and, and they were working that out in your life, or maybe you wish your parents did, you know, uh, a father or a mother, you know, whatever you're, wherever you're at in your life right now, um, or just growing up. But I'm here to tell you this, that your Father in heaven has a vision in mind for you. From the day before you were born, he has something in mind. And and, and he has been working in your life up to this point and through this point and into the future to try to bring about the things that he has God, that God has in store for you. He's a perfect father. And as much as that was awesome about King Richard, but our father in heaven has a vision in mind for your life. And he wants to bring that into fruition. He wants to mold you and shape you to be the person that he's created you to be, to do the things that he's called you to do. Just like King Richard, or his name's not King, but even like like Richard did uh, for for Zarina and, and Venus Williams. And uh, that's an amazing thing to think about that, that God has a vision, that God has something in mind. And even though we look at our past and we think I've messed up and I've done this, God's going to take our past, he's going to weave it into the future and weave it into um, um, the present, weave it into the future. He's going to make all things work to good for those that love him. And God has a vision, God has something in mind 
for you and I. And what I want to talk about this morning is a key ingredient from us in order for us to experience that, that, that vision, that plan that God has for our life. Um, you know, maybe you're here right now and, and, and you actually have something in front of you that seems like an impossible task. Maybe you have something that you're dealing with right now or something that you'd like to, uh, some, someone you'd like to be or somewhere you'd like to go, and it just seems like an impossible task. We're going to actually see this morning about a group of people who are faced with an incredible task, an impossible task in front of them. But God had a vision for them, and God knew where he wanted to take them. And again, as we look through this story, we're going to see what is the key ingredient that they had in order to activate the promises of God in their life. And I'll just tell you right now, um, that key ingredient is faith. Faith is the key ingredient for you and I to experience the promises of God in our life, to experience God in our life. It, it's faith. And um, we're going to be taking a look at a very familiar story uh, this morning. And I want to give a little bit of a background to the story because some of you may be familiar with it, some of you may not. But I want to give a little bit of a backstory here because I want us to feel the moment that we're going to get into this morning. I want us to feel the anticipation. I want us to feel the joy. I want us to feel the excitement of what these people are experiencing as God is about to do something um, in their midst. And uh, so it all started with this guy named Abram. God calls him, and he says, I'm, I want you to go to a place where I'm going to show you, and you and your family, and I'm going to make you a father of many nations. And, uh, and so he leaves. He's nowhere, he has no idea where he's going. He's just following God. And he doesn't have millions of people in his family. But God says, I'm going to make you into a great nation. And that's where Israel came from. So this whole journey began by faith, faith, trusting God. And he's following God. God ends up, uh, you know, multiplying his descendants. You have Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Jacob, his grandson. Um, he has kids. He has 12 kids. Um, Joseph is one of those kids. Um, Abraham's not along, around anymore, uh, but God's promise is still for them. God even promised Abraham a land. He said, I'm going to take you into this land flowing with milk and honey. This is going to be an incredible place. So God promised them an actual place. So uh, as this family's growing, um, if y'all are familiar with the story, Jacob and, and his sons, they experience a famine. Well, Joseph, it's another story here, but ended up in Egypt uh, being sold into slavery by his brothers. Hello. And, uh, but he raised up in the second in charge in Egypt, and he brings his family in Egypt to provide for them during the famine. So God's providing for their, uh, their family in the famine. And they multiply and multiply. And, you know, all, you know millions of people come in here are, 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 are growing, this, this, these Israelites. I don't even know, think they're called Israelites at that moment. And so, um, but they get so big that Pharaoh in Egypt says, these guys are getting too big. I got, they're gonna, they, they make them their slaves. So now they're slaves. So now they're in Egypt. They've got a place of provision. It's becoming a place of slavery. That's a whole other message right there or something. But um, I don't think they were supposed to stay in Egypt that long. But God raises up Moses. Y'all seen the movie, and, um, and uh, God raises up Moses, and, and God uses Moses and delivers them out of Egypt. They have to part the Red Sea, and then he takes them into a desert, hello? And, and he walks them into the desert, because a desert is a place where he's going to shape them, inform them, build their faith, reveal himself to them, and he wants to prepare them for the promise that he has for them. He takes them all the way up to the place, this promised land. And again, generations have gone by. And these people had known nothing but slavery. They, they've heard of God's promise, and they're right there. This is it. And they get some spies in there, and they see giant, like real giants. And they get scared, and they allow their faith to overcome, I mean, their fear to overcome their faith. And so they don't go in, and they, they don't trust God. They just obey God. So they, I don't know if you ever had that before. I know I could certainly have that, that story where I've had loud fear to overcome faith. At times in my life. And what happens? God says, you know what? The generation here, you're not going into the promised land. Forty years these people are in the desert. Forty years. That generation dies. A new generation grows up. Moses is dead. Um, Joshua now, a new leader, raises up. And God says, all right, we're going in. This is it. This is the time. And now this generation has an opportunity like the previous one. They're going to either going to allow their fear to overcome their faith or they're going to either move forward in faith and trust God. So this is the generation. I mean, imagine this. Imagine growing up and hearing your father, your grandfather talk about the Red Sea. God did this amazing thing. Maybe the plagues in, in Egypt, all this amazing stuff. And maybe you experienced some things in the desert, like God providing uh, for, for your nation in, in the desert. And now this is the time. This is your time. This is your time, your generation, to step into what God promised you. Just imagine the excitement, the anticipation. 
Maybe the nervousness of what they're experiencing. You, maybe you feel that way right now, right? You ever, you ever, you know, maybe when you're a guy, you're like, you're fixing to ask a girl out, you know, like you get that kind of nervousness. You're like, God's problem. I mean, I don't know about that, but, um, uh, you know, like you just like, this is it, right? Here's the problem is they're standing in front of a, a river, the Jordan River is its flood stage, and it's impossible for them to get through. You ever had that where you have something you feel like God has promised you, but there's something impossible is in front of you? You're like, I, gotta, I, I know that that's what God has for me, but how do I get to what God has for me? Because what's in front of me, it seems impossible. This is what they're sitting in front of. They're in front of this Jordan River, this impossible river at flood stage to, to, to cross over. And God says, I'm fixing to take you guys in. We're going to see what kind of faith you and I need to have to experience the promises of God, to step into our future. Um, so uh, we're going to start in verse, um, in verse 1 of Joshua, chapter 3. Um, chapter 3, verse 1. I'm going to read. It's kind of a lengthy story, so I'm going to read a lot of pat- uh, verses together. But we're going to mention a couple of things about faith in here. And then I'm going to end with um, some stories of our church. And then I'm going to talk about um, uh, maybe a Jordan that we're in front of right now is church. So verse 1. Um, then Joshua rose early in the morning, and they set out from Shittim. And they came to the Jordan, and he and all the people of Israel and lodged there before they passed over. At the end of the three days, the officers went through the camp. At the end of three days, remember what that, what that three days was like? Just waiting. Waiting. What's going to happen? So at the, uh, the officers went through the camp and commanded the people, As soon as you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God being carried by the Levitical priest, then you shall set out from your place and follow it. Yet there shall be a distance between you and it, about 2,000 cubits in length. Do not come near it, in order that you may know the way you shall go, for you have not passed this way before. The first thing we see about faith in here is this. Faith is trusting God to lead the way and make a way. Faith is trusting God to lead the way and to make a way. That's what following Jesus is. Following Jesus means that you don't necessarily know where you're going all the time. That's got to drive some of us crazy. Because we're, you know, a lot of us, we got to have a plan. we got to have it all figured out, right? Um, and, and God says, you need to follow the distance. You need to keep my eyes. Because the Ark of the Covenant was a, was a, a tangible uh, picture or presence of God. It had the Ten Commandments in there. So to them at this particular time, they got to keep their eyes on the presence of God. And only the priest could come near it. We don't have that anymore because Jesus Christ has died for our sin. And we have free access to God through the, you know, the repentance of sin and asking Christ as our Lord and Savior. We don't have to follow the distance anymore. We can follow near. We can follow with, with God. But this particular time, they got to they follow distance. They got to keep their eyes on the presence of God. They got to follow God. And, and they've never been this way before. They've never been this way before. I, I love it. You have not passed this way before. You ever, you ever have something from you? You've never been there before? You ever done that way before? Some of you may be right now that God has an opportunity for you and, you, and you don't know. And you're trying to figure it out. And God's like, I'm not trying to, I don't want you to figure it out. I want you to have faith. Because I've already worked it out. Don't spend your time trying to figure it out. If he says go, you go. So um, faith is trusting God to lead the way. I'm trusting it. But then not only to lead the way, but to make the way. They got to trust that, okay, I'm going to follow you. I'm following you into the river, and we're going to trust that God's going to make a way. Uh, you know, we, we, God at times will move in very practical ways. It's not that God's an impractical God. God, God will move in ways that, that seems very logical and makes sense, but at times God's going to lead us to do something that seems very illogical and doesn't seem very rational. And he's saying, I just want you to trust me. I'm going to make a way. I'm going to make a way. Maybe you're there right now. And God's saying, let me lead the way. I'll make a way. Verse 5, then Joshua said to the people, consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. That word consecrate is powerful. It means to be set apart. It means to, to cleanse, to sanctify. And during this time period, you know, part of that consecration is they would take baths and they put new clothes on. Is it like a sign of renewal? Um, hopefully, I mean, you know, people didn't take baths all the time during this time period. You know, I don't know if people still take baths all the time now, you know, but maybe you don't. But um, that is a big deal. Like they're taking baths. It's kind of a sign of like a renewal, right? So what God's saying is like, God's not saying you have to, you know, um, this is going to make me do this, but he's saying, I want you to do this to prepare for me to do something amazing in your life. And one of the things is we follow God that God wants us to be set apart. He wants to pursue holiness. He wants to remove sin in our life. 
And sometimes things that are, that are, that are, that are um, we don't see God work in our life sometimes because there's sin in our life that's blocking God's activity in our life. And God said, I, I want you to, to, to cleanse yourself. I want you, you know, we don't cleanse ourselves, but God, will you cleanse me? Maybe sometimes removing things away uh, from, 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 from our life. I was talking to somebody the, uh, the other day, yesterday, and this person is involved in some, uh, uh, some witchcraft stuff, and um, they're asking, you know, talk to me about it, and I was like, first thing, dude, they got to turn away from that. Like, you got you to turn away from what you're doing. You got to turn towards Christ, but you can't say, God, help me, and keep doing what you're doing. You got to turn away and turn towards Christ. So he's like, consecrate yourself. Get ready. Why? Because I'm going to do a miracle in your life. I'm fixing to do something that you're, it's going to blow your mind. He says, get ready. So here's the, the second thing. Not only is faith trusting God to lead the way and make the way is this. Faith is standing on God's promise before you see God's promise. Come on. Standing on God's promise before you see God's promise. Look in, uh, in verse 6. And Joshua said to the priests, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and pass on before the people. So they took up the Ark of the Covenant. It went before the people. The Lord said to Joshua, Today I will begin to exalt you in the, in the sight of all Israel, that they may uh, know that as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. And as for you, command the priests who bear the Ark of the Covenant. When you come to the brink of the waters of the Jordan, you shall stand in the Jordan. I've been to the Jordan River at flood stage. It's moving fast. Now, we're talk, not talking about like somebody like a real good swimmer trying to get through there because there's some military people and the, the spies that went into the land looking at Jericho. They got through this river. They were commended by it later on in the Bible. Um, but we're talking about means of people, young and old, you know, stuff, you know, animals getting through this river, right? And he says, listen, the priest, you're going to step into it and you're going to stand in the middle of it. Listen, you got to hold on this. And this is not the Red Sea. He's not going to part it and then you go get in it. He says, get in it, and you're going to see me move. And he's not going to do it the same way he did at the Red Sea. As we're going to see, he's going to, he's going to act in a different way. And listen, sometimes God, God is a God of miracles, but God doesn't always work the same way that he did in the past generation. God doesn't always do the same things. And we, sometimes when God moved, we expect him to do the same thing. And God is going to maybe do a miracle, but he's going to do it in a different way. He said, he's going to do something different. But they've got to stand on his word and stand on his promise. Can you imagine these guys? They're, they're, they got the Ark of the Covenant and they're standing in the, in the river. And it's still it's flood stage. And it doesn't tell us how long it took. You ever been standing somewhere, or standing on a promise before? And you're waiting? You're waiting for the financial breakthrough? You're waiting, you're standing on a promise for your marriage? You're standing on a promise for your kids? You're standing on a promise for some situation, and you're standing there, you're like, nothing's changed. Nothing's happened. But listen, faith is standing on God's promise before we see God's promise. Now, let me keep reading uh, with this point. In, jo in verse 9, And Joshua said to the people of Israel, Come here and listen to the words of the Lord your God. And Joshua said, Here's how you will know that the living God is among you, and that he will without fail drive out before you the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Perizzites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, and the Jebusites, and the bedbug bites. Um, um, just kidding. So um, I, I love it while he says, you're, I'm going to do this. Yeah, I'm fixing to do this for you because you need to know that you're fixing to encounter something else when you get into the land. But you need to know and what I did for you, and you're going to, remember, you're going to see that God, an all-powerful God that did that for us, he's going to drive out these people, right? He's going to drive out all these enemies. So he's doing this because he, he wants them to have confidence in him as they continue to be. He doesn't want them just to trust them to get into the land. He wants to trust them while they're in the land. So he want, he, he's doing this so that they can know that he's the living God, and they can remember how they got there. Verse 11, behold, the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth is passing over before you into the land. Now, therefore, take 12 men from the tribes of Israel, from each tribe a man. And when the soles of the feet of the priests bearing the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth shall rest in the waters of the Jordan. The waters of the Jordan shall be cut off from flowing. The waters coming down from above shall stand in one heap. Let me just keep reading this. Verse 14, so when the people set out from their tents to pass over the Jordan, with the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant before the people. 
And as soon as those bearing the ark had come as far as the Jordan, and the feet of the priests bearing the ark were dipped in the brink of the water, now the Jordan overflows all its banks throughout the time of harvest. The waters coming down from above stood and rose up in a heap very far away at Adam, the city that is beside Zarethan, and those flowing down toward the sea of the Arabah, the salt sea, were completely cut off and the people passed over opposite Jericho. You know what happened? When they got into the river, they didn't see God do anything. It was upstream that God started to work. The activity God was upstream, they didn't know what was happening upstream, but they're just standing on God's promises before they see God's promise. And when you and I are standing on God's promise, we may not see it, but we have to know that God is at work, that God is arranging things, God's moving things around, God is at work, and it might not be in our timetable, but God is on the move. And they had to wait until the waters cut off so then there's no more water coming through, and they got dry ground. Listen, sometimes we end up walking out back out of the water because we didn't stand it long enough. We didn't stand. God was at work, and we didn't know it. And I don't know if you're there this morning, but you're standing on something. You're trusting in God and a promise, and you don't see anything happen. And my encouragement to you is this. Don't get out of the river. Stand on his promise and trust him. God is a God who moves. And we don't always see it right away. But if we're willing to stand on his promise, you and I will see God move. Faith is standing on God's promise before you see God's promise. I mean, this is way upstream God start stopping the waters. Again, I don't know if they're there a minute, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, an hour. I don't, they got the ark, so it's kind of hard to hold up for a long time. But, um, but that's a lot going on. I mean, that's a, that's, this didn't happen just right away. The faith they had to have. You ever been in a moment where like that, where God's called you to trust him, maybe step out in faith, and, and maybe people are looking at you going, what are you doing? Why are you doing that? And you're like, I'm just trusting God. You're like, well, ain't nothing happening. You're fixing to fall over, right? But listen, if God calls you to do something, God will do it. He will do it. Standing on God's promises before you see God's promises. This is a... Uh, Last thing I want to mention in here is that we experience God when we obey God. Look at verse 17. Uh, now the priests bearing the ark of the covenant of the Lord stood firmly on dry ground in the midst of the Jordan. And all Israel was passing over on dry ground until the nation finished passing over the Jordan. Wow, man, these millions of people come across this river. And I don't, isn't it great? They didn't say that they just crossed over the river, but it was on dry ground. I, I, you know, it took me five and a half years to get out of college. But listen, I'm pretty sure, like, if it's a river and then the water keeps coming, the, water, the ground's going to be a little wet, a little mushy, right? Um, he says, no, 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 it's on dry ground. Because God wanted them to have stable footing when they crossed the Jordan. And listen, God wants to make a way, and he wants to make a stable way for you and I to trust him and to walk on stable ground. To step into the person that God's called you to be, to step in the place that God's calling you to, to be, whatever it may be. But we experience God when we obey God. We, we talk about this all the time here, that God is not, you know, it, God doesn't want us to know about his mercy, his justice, his love, his goodness, his grace, his comfort. You know, God wants us to experience it. God wants us to see that he's a provider. When Sunshine was in the hospital, you know, in the ICU, and I was praying scriptures of healing over her, you know, when she had her aneurysm rupture, and I was like, God, I know that you're a provider. God, I've seen you provide for me over and over again. I, I know your goodness. I know you're faithful. I want to know you as a healer. I want to experience you as a healer. I want to see that. Listen, God wants us to know him and to experience him. And these people have walked across dry ground, and they've experienced an amazing act of God, an amazing act of God. Um, let me read this last part here um, in chapter 4. Because um, God does something else after they cross the Jordan. He says in, in verse 1, it says, When all the nation had finished passing over the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, The twelve men from the people, from each tribe a man, and command them, saying, Take twelve stones from here out of the midst of the Jordan, from the very place where the priest's feet stood firmly, and bring them over with you, and lay them down in the place where you lodge tonight. Like, it's not enough for us to just walk across the river. Now you've got to get stones, and you've got to, you know, take these stones out of here but in verse 4 then Joshua called the 12 men from the people of Israel whom he had appointed a man from each tribe and Joshua said to them pass on before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of the Jordan and take up each of you a stone upon his shoulder according to the number of the tribes of the people of Israel that this may be a sign among you when your children ask in time to come what do these stones mean to you then you shall tell them 
that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. When it passed over the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off, so these stones shall be to the people of Israel and memorial forever. You know what he's telling you? I want you to get 12 stones because those stones are going to tell a story. You have those, I'm, I'm, I bet a lot of you, you got stones. You have some stones to tell a story of maybe what God's done in your life, of God's faithfulness, maybe through your family, maybe through your parents or your grandparents, or you've just, so, so, so those moments where, where you've crossed an impossible task, where God's done something impossible. God wants us to remember those things. God wants us to remember those. And why is he telling them to do that? Because there's a generation that's going to grow up and who has not experienced the Jordan, who they got to remember who got them across the Jordan so that they can trust the God who got them across the Jordan and trust that God in the promised land. Now, if you read on to the story, that didn't happen. But the whole point of these stones was that you could tell these ch- the children, tell your children what God did so it can move from one generation to the next. What, what stones do you have in your life that, that, that tell a story of what God's done in your life? Because I don't know where you're at this morning. Maybe there's a, a Jordan in front of you. Maybe God's calling you to do something impossible. But listen, faith is trusting God to lead the way and to make a way. Faith is standing on God's promises even before we see God's promises. And we experience God and we obey God. I want to take the rest of this time, I want to tell you, I want to share some stones from this church with you. Some of you are familiar with these, some of you might not be familiar. But I want to share some stones about how God has, do, has taken this church across the Jordan. How God has used this church and worked in this church to do miracles. Because we need to remember we need to remember the God that we serve. We remember the God that's done some amazing things um, in our midst, in our church. And these are certainly not all of them, but there's just some of them that came to my mind. First story is this, is that this church met in Elkins High School years ago. And uh, they built a building over in Vicksburg. And um, um, it, part of, of that building is they wanted to build a gym floor. Those of you that are familiar with that building had a basketball gym in it. Pretty sweet. Um, and, uh, but it needed, I think, I'm... Not 100% on the figures, but I know it's five figures. I, I'm, I think it was around 15000 what the church needed to be able to say, we're going to lay a floor on the gym floor, uh, to make it, lay a gym floor for a basketball gym. And they had to have it the next week. So this is Sunday. That next week, the church had to have that money. If they didn't have it, they weren't going to be able to do the gym floor. Um, our previous pastor, Mark Dean, you know, I've heard him tell the story many times. Uh, after church at Elkins, some guy who was not a member of the church just happened to come to the church, and he um, told him that he had gotten some inheritance. And he just wanted to give it to the church and gave him a check and left. Never saw him again. And Mark said he folded up, put his pocket, didn't think of it. And he got home and it was $15,000. That's a stone. That's a stone. You know, I was at the church at this point and um, I remember sitting in an office with a few other people and looking at, you know, there's an unreached people group in Senegal. And, um, and, we were pr- or some other different ones, and we, got, we felt God was leading us to go reach the Makanya people in Senegal. And um, this is, we had, were over in Vicksburg, and we didn't, you know, it cost a lot of money to get over there, you know, overseas and, and all that kind of stuff. And um, the church raised thousands of dollars to get people over there the first trip. So it was at least, it was about 10 years we did this. Um, and I, I could be wrong, but I think over that 10 years, we did over 30 trips over there. And there, that, the Senegal thing was never in the budget. It was always raised from the people in this church. And I'd say over that time period, it was probably at least half a million dollars given. There's two buildings in Senegal right now. This church stepped up and gave. Um... I remember in 2008, um, driving down 521, and uh, I was living, we, Sunshine, we're living with some people in Siena Point, and I see this thing that says Master Plan Community coming soon, it's Glendale Lakes. And I remember I drive by every morning when I was youth pastor here, and, um, and I felt like, man, that's what God wants, God wants to build, a Master Plan Community. That, that's what he wants the church to, like, what would a Master Plan Community that was following Christ, what would that look like? So I get this aerial view of the master plan community. And um, I'm like, it, it would look like marriage is this, you know, you know grown in intimacy, kids being raised to love God, people being stewards of finances, people giving, you know, people playing sports, honoring God, all these different, you know, things. I had these little bubbles coming up from the aerial. I remember giving it to Pastor Mark. Listen, we were not in a master plan community. 
We're over in Vicksburg. Like a few months later, Chad Bertrand from Trinity Baptist Church calls and said, hey, our, this church here in the Master Plan community is looking to merge. We'd see if you guys would be interested in merging with us. I thought, I don't even need to pray about that. <laughs> I mean, I prayed about that, but it was clear. I'm like, that's exactly, for me, I was like, I'm sitting here thinking about this master, and now you're telling us that we're moving into a master plan community? Hello? Um, so we, we did. We merged, um, and a lot of you were part of that, and um, that and we moved over here in, in 2011. Listen, that was not easy. You know, we had to take out a loan, finish this building. We, you know, we still had, we had two buildings for a long period of time, and, um, uh, but we felt God was leading us here, that God was leading us into this area. We had a lot of people live in Siena in that, in, at the church. And we felt God was leading us over here. And this was always a temporary deal. The building we had was bigger than this building. And so we thought, you know what, we're going to come over there. I know it's smaller, but we're going to do what God's called us to do. And then we're gonna, you know, we'll build you know, um, on here. We have seven acres. And um, you know, so we were here for a while. Um, uh, of course, I, I left, and I came back in 2017. Um, the building sold in Vicksburg. And when it sold in Vicksburg, we could pay off all our debt. So we were able to be debt-free. And uh, then uh, the church ended up, you know, I ended up coming back as an associate pastor, and they created a position for me that was, no, that was not, in, uh, not there. And so, um, um, and over that time in 2017, lat- the in later part of 17, until right before COVID, we grew a lot. Our church was growing, um, and COVID hit. Um, I don't need to explain that to you. Um, and so, um, but our, God carried this church through COVID. And I will tell you that many people throughout the years, I say many people, there, there's a number of people that would tell our church, you guys aren't going to make it. You, you, in a year from now, you're not going to be here. A number of people would, would say that to us over all the years, right? God provided for us in COVID. Um, it was, um, I mean, you know, we didn't have to shut the doors or anything like that. I mean, we had to, you know, not meet for a while, but God provided miraculously for us uh, through COVID. Um, Actually, even go back before COVID, um, we hired a, a part-time youth pastor uh, when I came back in 17, so this is before COVID, and the Saturday night before church on Sunday, the youth pastor had lost his other part-time job, and he and his wife spent the night at our, uh, our house, and so the next morning, we were voting to affirm the budget for the following year, and I went to Mark, and I said, listen, uh, you know, Rory lost his job. You know, the money that we're offering, we're paying him, it's not going to, you know, Mark, that morning of voting on the budget, said, I, I rec- can we get a, a recommendation to amend to increase the salary by $10,000? I mean, we're voting on it. Got amended, got passed. The next week, somebody showed up with a check for ten grand. Got provided. Um, The church's number of times, Heart of Texas Prison Ministry. Hey, we're raising 10 grand for this summer. We got three months, raise 10 grand. Every time, raising money, 10 grand. This church raising money, 10 grand. Seeing God work. Uh, we came back in fall 2021. Uh, Sunshine has Mandy Kissel come in and do something on Narnia with the kids on a Wednesday night. In August, October 17th, 21, Sunshine has their aneurysm rupture. Mandy was already in place doing children's ministry. It's like God already knew. He, he already provided somebody for there. So Sunshine, you know, is recovering, and uh, she steps down, and Mandy becomes the children's director. Hey, li- listen, God, God already knew. We didn't, we didn't have that in plan. Listen, Mandy, you need to come up here and start helping out because Sunshine's going to have an aneurysm, and you're going to have to come in. We had no idea, like, right? But God did. God knew what was going to happen. Um, just over a year ago, Pastor Mark retires. And, uh, you know, we're going to go through a pastor's transition. First time in, I don't know, 20-something years this church has been through that. Um, Mandy, our children's director, is leaving. I don't know if y'all remember that. Um, so uh, during that pr- pastor transition, we're just trusting God, right? And I had to go find a children's minister. Well, there happens to be Brittany and Steve Alclair in my small group who didn't go to our church at the time, but they're in a small group. And long story short, she becomes the children's minister. It was like just a seamless transition. And she's the children's director today. It's like God already provided. He already had somebody in store for it. These are all just stones you can look back and see the faithfulness of God. Um, again, pastor transition, you know, I, you know, 
became pastor here July 23rd, so it's been, you know, uh, just under a year um, I've been here. Um, I remember sitting in staff meeting for the upcoming fall, and I said, listen, we're going to do Awanas on Wednesday night, and we're going to have 50 kids. I remember Brittany and Katie looked at me like, what do you want? I mean, you're crazy, um, which is probably true. Um, but, you know, we had o- over 50 kids register for Awanas. And I think consistently around 40-something, we're up here on Wednesday nights, and so many of you, and we and look in the, the church, we're like, we need, we got everybody, we need people to step up, we need people to serve on Wednesday nights for Awana kids, and so many of you stepped up, and it was an amazing thing that happened this, this, this fall and spring with Awanas, and we expect that to be even more, um, we expect it to even be more next year. So why am I sharing all that? Because this church has seen God, there's just a, just a few things, has seen God do amazing, amazing things in this church. And I think we think that right now he's calling us to step out in faith. We believe God's called us to this area where we're at right now. And he's called us into a community where thousands and thousands of people are on. We have seven acres here. God, what do you want us to do? Um, we've been looking at um, doing some renovation here at the church. Um, I'm fixing to tell you about that. And um, we had to spend some money on architects and, you know, to get a design and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, I was going to do some crayons, but that wasn't going to work. But um, so, uh, you know, uh, at, one point I'll, at one point our elders weren't sure if we should move forward with that or not because, you know, the giving always goes like this. Um, and uh, we actually paused. We said yes, and then we paused. And when we paused, $70,000 came into this church. Not for that project, but it just came in. And we thought, God is parting the Jordan. So here we are. Here we are as a church. And um, I think God's calling us to step out in faith. And so let me share with you um, some things that we want, that we're looking at doing here as a church. We're going to have a meeting right after church, but I wanted to share some of this. If you're visiting with you, with us today, you know, you get to get knee deep in here. I'm hearing some things, uh, maybe, um, but, um, uh, you know, we are, we, we, we are so crystal clear on what God's calling us to do, and that is to inspire people to follow Jesus and who inspire other people to follow Jesus, to make disciples who make disciples. And, man, my son plays baseball out here in Santa Youth Baseball League. I don't know how many of you people live in the neighborhood, but I've seen this area where it kind of stopped at Ridgepoint. It's a whole other neighborhood past Ridgepoint, and they're still building. There's mat, thousands thousands of people in this community. And I'm just driving by, and I'm like, look at all these homes, look at all these families. You know, I'm thinking, what if by the year 2040, 10,000 people were on mission with Jesus that are not on mission with Jesus? And um, so we have been looking. We had a building team get together. Chuck Lauder was leading the building team. And we just said, like, okay, God, what, do you, what, what can we do in our building? There's a lot of needs that we have in our, our current building. Um, and so um, we obviously are maxed out on space on Wednesday nights with kids. Uh, if you've been up here at Awanas on Wednesday nights, um, we, we have some space to grow here on Sunday morning, the worship area. Um, but if you were here on Easter, we had 120 people here on Easter. And um, it was packed, like that hallway Shoulder to shoulder, you can't get, move around much. Um, Awanas, it's packed, you're shoulder to shoulder. We're like, we need to create a, a more inviting and a larger space to connect and engage with people and, and, and create a, a welcoming environment when people come into the church. As soon as people come in, they see that there's space for them. It automatically will make the space look bigger right away. And we thought, you know, what can we do where we're not going to take out the million dollar loan? But what can we do at the moment? that we can uh, enlarge space and create a connection for people in our church. Um, so we looked at what would look like if we renovate the front space up here in the foyer area. So um, that's what it would look like. Um, that is you standing in front of the food. <laughs> There's no food right there. Um, the office is gone, and that back room is, is um, it's actually kind of transplanted. I'll talk about that in a minute. But um, that is what um, uh, that area where the TV is, that uh, ceiling is raised 11 inches, and um, we thought, you know, we can create some space, maybe do a couple more pictures, um, those are with, um, those are you ghosts, but they're, um, <laughs> they're people that are not here yet, um, and so they're just an idea, that's at the back corner looking in, uh, there's two glass doors there, 
Um, and so this is what this space would look like. We said, hey, what it would look like if we actually had a meeting in there, like an intro or something. So they just put tables in there. We don't have those tables, but they just wanted to give a picture of what that would look like in here. Um, and so um, we could probably get more in there. There's 44 chairs in there. So this is a big space that we would create. And we feel like that this, is, this could make an immediate impact um, on our church by creating space for people to connect, for people to, to engage, to help create community. Um, and to, to be um, the first thing they come into the building is that they see this is a welcoming environment. This is an environment that's safe. And I'm telling you, it make this place look bigger without having to make the sanctuary even look bigger because we can go to two services when we need to. Um, so, um, uh, again, I just want us to think through 120 people here, what that hallway will look like. It's going to be very, very, very crowded um, in here. Um, I'll just tell you this. We'll go into more in the meeting about this, but um, the office, where's the office going? Um, well, it's being moved. So we don't have, I'm going to show a picture of that. We don't have a rendering, and I don't have a crayon picture of that either. But um, it's going to be moved in the back of the building. I'll talk more about that at the meeting. Um, and then we're actually going to re revamp in the children's area. And, uh, and so that room that it, up at the front, it's, um, that space is added on to the back in the children's area. Well, I'll talk more about that. Brittany will um, in the meeting right after church. And so we feel like that this is an opportunity for us um, as a church. Like, God, okay, how can we begin to take a step? This is not the whole thing. This is just a step that we can do. Uh, we eventually want to add on to the back and make a much larger children's and youth area in the back. We think, hey, maybe this is just a first step for us uh, to put our foot in the water and say, God, we want to trust you. Um, I will tell you right now, this, we are estimating this would be about $100,000, um, and that includes AC cost. Come on. <laughs> um, uh, you, we, we have some issues with ACs, um, and, uh, and that could be around fifty grand. Uh, to fix. Um, they're about 13 years old. So incorporated in this project is dealing with the AC issue. Um, and uh, so what we're asking uh, the church to do is stay for this meeting right afterwards, but we're asking the church over the next few weeks to, to pray, to pray and to seek God's will and his direction. And um, um, is, is together as a church, we're in agreement that, hey, this is where God's leading us. This is what uh, we're going to step out in faith to do. And uh, with the approval of that in a couple of weeks, we'll talk about funding. But I'll tell you that we, we're hoping to raise that money. Um, and I think that this church can do it. It's just another stone. Amen. It's just another stone. Um, matter of fact, I think this church can do a lot more than that. Um, God has incredible things in store for this church. And this is just an opportunity for us to trust him together, to walk with him to depend on him and to see things him do and for us to be able to be a group of people that says, look at what God did. Look at what God's doing. So I'm, I'm going to pray for us this morning. Um, and again, maybe you're in your, maybe your own uh, life. Um, you feel like there's a Jordan in front of you and uh, maybe God's calling you to trust him in, in, in a particular situation. Whatever, whatever it may be, but I'm just going to pray and um, what I'm going to do is, um, I tell you what, we'll do a close, we'll do a, uh, we'll do a, uh, a shorter song. Yeah, I'm going to pray. Yeah, and then just, uh, we'll have a time of, of, of just a reflection and prayer, and then I'll come up and, uh, and, and we'll end the service. So let me pray for us. Jesus, I love you. Uh, we love you. And thank you, Lord, for doing so many things in our midst. Lord, for showing up in so many remarkable, remarkable ways. From the very get-go, Lord, you, you have shown yourself to be so faithful. Lord, we feel like that this is our time. This is a time for us to, to, to step into what you have for this church, Lord. I pray that you would just unite our church together, Lord, that we would listen for your voice, that we would uh, respond to your voice, and that we would step out in faith, Lord. I thank you that you are the God of impossible, Lord, that you cause the things that are impossible to be possible, Lord. I pray those that may be here this morning that are struggling to trust you in a particular area, Lord, give them faith, Lord. God, give them faith and courage, Lord, to stand on a promise, Lord, even though they don't see it yet. We love you, God. We praise you. Mosque all these in your name, Jesus.